Um, so I'm Lauren and I'm going to be talking about my work, which is um, looking at the dynamics of Picoli to Sassel droplets. Um, so first of all, what is a Sassel droplet? Well, it's um, this droplet here. This way. Here we go. Um, just on the right here, so um, it's just a droplet on a surface here. And um, there's been very few studies of um, peakily sized sessile droplets. So previous studies of sessile droplets, but they've always been kind of at that larger size. Um, and um, sessile droplets have applications kind of like quite broad ranging, um, obviously the usual um, industrial applications. Um, but for me, I'm mostly interested in um, this kind of disease transmission and the formation of fomites. Um, so the viability of bacteria and viruses has been kind of assumed based on these larger droplets that have been studied, but these aren't necessarily going to be biologically relevant or kind of the size of respiratory droplets that are going to be emitted from people. So um, we definitely need to kind of look into these uh, smaller sizes. Oops, sorry, I'm going to do that the whole way. <laughs> Um, so kind of just a brief overview of the dynamics of sessile droplets. We're going to have um, the kind of initial impact of the droplet on the surface, um, then it will spread and oscillate, and then it's eventually going to relax. Oh gosh, sorry. <laughs> um, so this is kind of um, just an image of droplet on the surface, and the exact kind of spreading um, is going to de uh, be determined by the interaction between the droplet and the specific surface. And then here we just have um, kind of schematic of uh, the droplet oscillation. So um, it becomes deformed and then due to its surface tension and the interaction with the surface, it's going to oscillate and then relapse. Um, however, we can't really think of these um, as kind of happening um, independently and consecutively. Um, the spreading and oscillating is gonna happen um, kind of in competition with um, one another. And so um, if we look at, um, Kind of some models for the spreading and the oscillating of droplets. Um, spreading um, has been modelled um, using Tanner's law, which is this equation here. Um, so this um, models the, um, the radius of the droplet on the surface um, with time, and this has been um, kind of um, parameterized for much larger droplets. Um, however, I wanted to probe to see whether this was still appropriate for the picoliter size. And then um, the same for the oscillations, we have uh, this equation here, um, which um, is dependent on the surface tension. And then we've also got this eigenvalue term, which um, takes into account the contact angle of the sessile droplet on the surface. Um, so if we look at these two um, models here, if we first start with the 2.5 millimeter radius droplet, you can see that um, the time it takes for the droplet to um, double in radius, so just this gray shaded region here, is on a much faster time scale than the droplet is oscillating. So we can essentially think of these two processes as happening consecutively. The droplet's going to spread and then it's going to oscillate. Whereas if we look at this, um, this kind of smaller size, which is what I'm interested in, you can see that the time it takes for the droplet to double in size is kind of on the same time scale as that oscillating. And I kind of first... Um, started looking into any kind of spreading dynamics. When I first took um, a video of just a water droplet on a glass slide, and I was seeing a lot of spreading um, kind of interference, I was only naively expecting to see some really nice clean oscillations. However, then I saw some kind of interference from the spreading, which is when I started looking a bit more into the kind of spreading dynamics. Um, so this kind of led me to um, try to optimize um, the system in both cases. So I decided to do kind of two separate experiments. So I've got um, spreading experiments and oscillating experiments. So when I'm kind of probing the, the spread, I really want to optimize that. So I use a borosilicate um, hydrophilic surface. So this has got a zero degree contact angle for both water and ethanol. And this is going to facilitate that spreading. Um, whereas when I kind of want to probe the oscillations, um, I use the opposite. So a Teflon hydrophobic surface. And this gives a, a high contact angle and it's going to hopefully facilitate those oscillations. Um, so kind of if anyone has you know, done any kind of experimental um, design, you know that there's a few kind of different processes you need to go through. Obviously, you're going to start with the initial concept and then you're going to have a kind of preliminary um, experimental design. Um, then you obviously need to kind of test out this design with some proof of concept experiments. And this is going to kind of naturally be a cyclical process where you're going to then um, change the experimental design. And then eventually you're kind of going to go on to those kind of end goal applied experiments. Um, so for me, those applied experiments are going to be um, looking at um, surrogate respiratory droplets. So kind of using low solubility salts that are found in respiratory fluids. And I'm interested in, um, in the impact and the evaporation dynamics of these droplets. Um, but today I'm mainly just going to focus on um, some kind of proof of concept experiments that I have some results for, haven't quite moved on to this stage yet. 
Um, so this is an overview of my experimental design. Um, I'm using a high frame rate imaging technique and I'm using 100,000 frames per second, um, which kind of allows me to probe oscillations of a roughly 50 micrometer um, radius drop, sorry, diameter droplet, um, which oscillates at a frequency of about 30 um, kilohertz. Um, and I'm using a um, high frame rate imaging technique rather than stroboscopic because I need the surface to be um, to be clean. So stroboscopic wouldn't be appropriate because obviously I'd be having a continual um, stream of droplets that would be impacting on the surface. So I need to just image that one kind of event that's happening, one droplet hitting the surface. Um, so I have a synchronous um, camera and dispenser trigger, and this is controlled by um, custom software. So this means that there's kind of no dead frames um, between the camera beginning to record and the dispenser ejecting the droplet. And then once the camera is um, kind of recording, um, this then triggers the LED to kind of turn on. Um, so this kind of reduces any kind of heating from having the LED on for an unnecessary amount of time. Um, so just kind of looking at some of these um, proof of concept experiments that I've done, um, I looked at um, water ethanol mixtures. So I looked at 13 different concentrations between zero and 100% ethanol. And these are good mixtures to look at because um, we have um, known values for the surface tension um, of the bulk of these um, of these um, fluids. Um, and we, because there's no kind of surface actives within the water or the ethanol, we wouldn't really expect those um, surface tensions to, to differ from the bulk um, with these peak water droplets. And you can see here um, from the literature values that um, ethanol does drastically reduce the surface tension, um, which is good because that means that if we look at these um, different concentrations here, we can kind of probe or attempt to probe um, a, a wide range of surface tensions using this technique. So first of all, um, if I go through um, the spreading experiments that I've um, done, so we've got the, this is on the borosilicate surface. So first of all, we have the 5% um, ethanol droplet. And you can see that it comes down, it does oscillate briefly, but then it does begin to spread. It's quite slow, it's maybe not that obvious, so keep watching that one. Um, whereas if we look at the 80% ethanol, you can see that oscillates very briefly and then begins to spread um, quite obviously on the surface. Um, so then I kind of took this experimental data and compared it to that Tanner's law um, equation that I showed before. And um, we could see that for kind of across all of the different concentrations, um, the gradient of um, of the experimental data was the same as Tanner's law. So this goes to show that the, um, the rate of spread um, kind of matches this, um, this model. However, for the lower concentration, so looking at this 5%, um, there was a kind of delay in spreading, which, which has given this kind of gap between uh, the model and the experimental data here. Whereas then if we look at the 80%, um, there was much fewer oscillations kind of delaying that spreading. So this gap um, is kind of reduced and um, it's kind of fits uh, to Tanner's law a bit closer. Um, so then if we just kind of look at this area, so this gray shaded region across all the different concentrations, kind of just what I explained there, where we saw that, that area between the experimental and uh, the model um, was reduced with the increasing ethanol concentration. Um, so kind of just to summarize this here, um, low ethanol concentrations um, kind of have a high surface tension and that's causing in this 5% example, um, the droplets oscillate, which is delaying the spreading. So then if we look at the um, oscillation experiments, um, here this is using the Teflon as the surface, you can see that it's a much higher contact angle and there's kind of more visible um, oscillations. Um, and then if we look at the 50%, again, there's a couple of oscillations, but because of this lower contact angle and spreading interference, we're definitely observing fewer oscillations. So then what we're able to do is um, get the aspect ratio with time of the droplet as it's oscillating. And then we can do a Fourier transform of this. And uh, once we've got the frequency from the Fourier transform, we can calculate the surface tension here. Um, so if we then compare the experimental um, with the literature values, um, we saw that we could kind of accurately determine the surface tension for between about um, 0 and 20% um, ethanol. However, once we started going above that, we were kind of getting a, a lower surface tension than what we would expect from the literature value. And this kind of isn't to say that we would expect those droplets to have a lower surface tension. It's that we're observing a systematic error, um, kind of just using this technique. So with this kind of 50%, there's just too few oscillations kind of visible for us to then do an accurate Fourier transform and kind of pull out the surface tension. So again, this is kind of just summarized here with the difference between the experimental and the literature values. And kind of anything above 50% was really just not retrievable at all. 
Um, so just to kind of summarize here, um, I've gone through a couple of proof of concept experiments uh, where we showed that for peak elisa droplets, spreading is well defined by Tanner's law for these lower surface tension um, droplets. And um, kind of conversely, oscillations are you know, observable for high surface tension droplets and we're able to kind of accurately pull out the surface tension. Um, and then for kind of surface tension kind of in the middle, it's neither well defined by Tanner's law nor um, has enough oscillations um, observable to kind of pull out that surface tension. And so now I'm kind of uh, looking at or beginning to look at um, aqueous sucrose um, droplets, and this is so I can probe the viscous effects. And kind of naturally, this is leading to some more experimental changes. And then I'm hoping that once this is kind of um, optimized, I'll then be able to kind of move on to my applied experiments. Um, which, as I kind of briefly mentioned, is going to be looking at these surrogate respiratory droplets. Um, and kind of the ideal kind of end goal experiment would be to compare the evaporation dynamics of the droplets on a surface with um, some EDB measurements of three droplets um, on the surface to see whether there's any kind of surface effects. Um, so yeah, that's everything from me. So thank you very much. I just want to say a special thanks to Jim and um, Jonathan. And yeah, thank you for listening. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, do you have any questions? One from Andrew. Uh, Lauren, can you repeat the question that you might answer? Otherwise, I'd like to hear. Yeah. Come back. Oh, oh this one. Yeah. So you, you saw very different decay rates in your observation. Is that due to um, purely surface tension or what is the source of that? Um, I the the viscosity of uh, the viscosity does increase with increasing ethanol concentration, so I guess that could have been also kind of a factor. But I think the main thing that was really clear was that um, the droplet was at higher ethanol concentration was impacting, and then it was just kind of sp spreading much quicker than at those lower concentrations. But I think yeah, viscosity definitely plays a, a part as well. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't read out the question. It was about viscosity. <laughs> Can you talk a bit about the uh, the hydrogen factor in the in the, in the, the oscillations to the two Is there is there a function of form to the hydrogen factor or is it just in the fudge factor? Um yeah, essentially a fudge factor at the moment. Brian asked about the eigenvalue. Um, so for um, free droplets, that's um, defined really nicely using spherical harmonics, whereas um, at the moment that's not really been um, kind of probed that um widely so at the moment it is kind of just a fudge factor there's been some uh, models that have been predicted and then compared with experimental results um so it's at the moment just a relationship between uh the kind of eigenvalue and the contact angle so you just determine the contact angle and then you get an eigenvalue out at the moment Great, we'll one minute yeah so that's um sorry i i don't know your name um the question was about um the challenges with uh, the viscosity of the sucrose droplets so um that's definitely something i'm experiencing at the moment so um one kind of way that we've um, changed the technique now is to have a, um, a kind of actual pulse and a dummy pulse um so this just means that we're kind of constantly refreshing uh the the dispenser tip which is kind of helping with the viscosity issues um and then so we've got the dummy pulse kind of going constantly and then when we're ready to kind of capture the images we then have the actual pulse so that allows us to have that really kind of high um voltage pulse i guess that is necessary to eject those viscous droplets thank you Ron. We're going to move on to the story. So I'm moving now with a few thoughts, much more into aerosol than tech. And the story is going to be talking about.